Hi guys, this is Crossy of Eclipse Gaming TV and welcome to my channel and a little bit of a thrown together last minute uh, bit of a, a conversation, really kick a few ideas around. I doubt this is going to be much of a uh, Q&A because I haven't announced it or planned anything or, or whatever. Just going to chat away for a, a while and, and see where we go. But uh, there is a, a couple of reasons why uh, I've uh, gone to uh, record this. Um, I had a pretty bad cast last night. And, you know, it's one of those things, it happens. Uh, I started commentating on uh, Counter-Strike. I don't know exactly the time, but it will have been over 10 years ago now. I've uh, been involved in it for a long time. And while it's never been a full-time thing for me, you know, when I started out, it just wasn't possible. Really, those opportunities didn't exist. And with where I want to go life-wise, having a regular constant income um, for, you know, in a job that I've worked at for a long time is a better fit for me than trying to pursue the esports thing. So I've never really um, gone for it as a full-time thing, but have always been floating around. Uh, a lot of the major events that you will end up watching in the Counter-Strike field in particular, I have either commentated at those events or commentated with some of the people that have been at, at those events. And no, it's been cool. It's been a, a great experience and I've absolutely loved um, big parts of that. But mistakes happen. There are issues. And, you know, it's not just for casters. Casters have a bad day or a bad cast. Players have a bad game once in a while. And, you know, the number of games that a player will have in terms of warm-up and that sort of thing, they probably have a couple of bad games a week. Um, and, you know, it's just one of those things. DJs have a bad set once in a while. And I've had those, but I don't have my controller anywhere near. Um, musicians have a bad gig once in a while. And I'm not going to play this for you. Don't worry about it. But just wanted to show it off. Um, recently got this pick guard put on my... Uh, Telecaster, a little bit of a uh, homage to Prince, one of my uh, favourite artists of all time. And no, I, I can't play guitar anywhere near as well as him and probably never will be able to, but we all have to um, have aspirations, right? Uh, but it happens. And I've seen some casters that I've worked with in the past who are either have stacked loads of potential or are just talented in general, probably a combination of both actually, who have had uh, bad casts and have really got down on themselves about it. And, you know, it's one of those things that you just have to uh, swallow, really, and, and wanted to touch on that a little bit. So last night I commentated a game, a best of three. The first map, we missed most of it due to various technical issues. I couldn't get the game to show up on stream. Um, when I did get the game to show up on stream, I had a, an ad scrolling through uh, over half of the uh, team stats, which is um, always good to see from a, a viewer standpoint. Um, for some reason, I had my uh, microphone uh, running through a guitar amp sim, which uh, is, if I put this on for you now, I don't know if it's done the same thing, but uh, it probably sounds absolutely trash compared to uh, how it was before. Let's uh, drop that back. But the mixer that I've got, for this uh, headset, so it's got a uh, microphone on one side. I normally have my guitar plugged into the other side and completely forgot that was a thing. Um, cool thing as well is I can throw in some uh, very over-the-top reverb whenever I need to if I just lean down to my right. But uh, we won't be using that today. But yeah, it's just an absolute shocker. Everything that possibly could go wrong did go wrong. Um, I eventually got it all fixed into the first map was going to crack straight into it, delivered a brilliant intro to try and save myself, looked in a couple of rounds later and realized that the game sound and the microphone sound was muted. <laughs> Had to do the whole thing again. Didn't do it anywhere near as uh, well as I did the uh, first time and uh, all quite disappointing. Uh, map number two, I used to pull it back um, to a point and uh, did some fairly good stuff, I think, uh, in the second map and into the third. I just had a not really a meltdown but the way that the first map had started didn't really get off on the right foot and the gig was a, a last minute thing anyway and I just didn't really feel like I was uh, up to my 
um, usual standards. So all in all, uh, fairly disappointing. Uh, luckily, because of the amount of time that I have uh, been doing this and it's with an organisation that I've done a lot of work with in the past and prior to them being an organisation, a couple of the main people in it, I've done things for them in the past as well over an extended period of time. And it's probably not going to put pay to my uh, future chances of working with them in the future. But um, I think considering that I would hold myself to a much higher standard than that and have delivered that higher standard for them for an extended period of time, it probably seemed even more out of character than uh, it normally would, which is a, a little disappointing and something that I definitely want to uh, look at correcting. But the important thing in this situation is not to get too down about it. And whatever stage that you're at in your commentary journey, if you're to the level that I'm at in terms of experience more than anything else, um, you know, you've got plenty of good things to fall back on. And even if you're in your first couple of years, you'll still have plenty of top quality stuff that you know that you've put out that you can fall back on and think, no, I'm, I can do this. I am good at this. It was a one-off. It's not a problem. And that's something that you need to... Um, think about as I say mistakes happen bad nights happen and it's how you uh, bounce back from those things uh, that are important and if you are just starting out and you're learning and you're learning as you go well the big thing that you're going to have with that is a lot of mistakes are going to happen because you are lacking that experience you may get thrown curveballs you don't know how to find a way around it you know if you are having those technical issues do you uh, you know, stick with it and persevere until you get them resolved or do you just throw your hands up and say, I don't know what to do here and uh, sack it off and, and live to fight another day? You know, that's going to happen way more often to you starting out than it is when you've been uh, doing it a couple of years. And you have to take those on the chin, learn from them, learn the hard way, dust yourself off and uh, continue uh, once again. But um, yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there as a uh, don't get, too down on yourself you have to look at these things and you have to look at them critically and I think that's where you see some of your biggest improvements other than being thrown in at the deep end and having to sort of fend your way out of it is when you look back on these situations be critical of yourself be constructive and find ways that you can improve and learn from the mistakes that happen but do it in a way that is beneficial and constructive and not being too overly negative about it and then the other thing to uh, touch on as well is just if you get yourself into a bit of a funk or a bit of a rut or you don't really know where you're um, planning to go next or it feels a bit stale or um, something like that and it was part of the uh, experience um, that I what am I trying to say it's a little bit of that experience I had in the third map yesterday and uh, that's a, a kind of interesting one as well um, the first thing to um, think about, and this is, um, I think, quite common for people that go into the commentary route rather than the player route. And it's something that I took an active step on. Um, years ago now, I must be talking, I've completely lost track of the time frame again, but um, flashback maybe five years ago for Counter-Strike. And I went through a phase where I just didn't play any Counter-Strike. It's probably 18 months before I played any kind of competitive, even like a jump on for a random matchmaking on a Smurf. I didn't do any of that for about 18 months. And I was doing bits of work here and there, you know, on, on the side, nothing too major. Um, as, I, as I say, casting's never been a full-time thing for me. It's just something that I do for enjoyment. And it's something that um, when there is money on the table, it's a nice bit of extra pocket money towards holiday spending money or um, my expensive taste in guitars and watches and cars and all that stuff that I just can't afford, but buy anyway and uh, live off of uh, bread and milk for the rest of the month, you know, all that good stuff. But um, it's, it's fine. It's uh, just one of those things that uh, we all have to... Uh, we all have to uh, deal with. But um, yeah, I didn't play for 18 months. And then an opportunity came up to uh, cover an event. And it's an event, um, it's the Insomnia uh, events here in the UK, the Land Series. And my first uh, Insomnia was uh, I-30. So let's just jump back to uh, the old Google and see when that will have been. 
Okay. So that was April 2007 was uh, Insomnia 30. So that was my uh, first event uh, that I uh, commentated at in the Counter-Strike series on stage. So that will have been uh, just over 13 years ago. There we go. We've got a uh, time scale on this thing. And uh, I think I started playing Counter-Strike in 2005. So that would add up actually spending some time playing competitive-ish. I was terrible, but uh, that was the thing until commentary came along. And um, yes, yeah, so that would have been my first event. So if we're talking four years ago, it will have been coming up a decade since I did my first event. And there were other events that came up in between that I played at and commentated at and whatever. So I was no stranger to that particular event. And for anyone that's been involved in uh, Counter-Strike and the flack that UK casters get, I don't know if other games are the same or if uh, the communities are a little uh, more lenient on us, but... Uh, the UK casters get absolutely hammered more often than not when it comes to uh, feedback in the chat. And uh, for this particular event, you know, it wasn't too bad. I think uh, you know, some of the comments that came in is these casters are okay or these casters aren't too bad. And when you get that as a UK caster at a UK event and you've got people saying in the chat, these guys aren't bad, you will absolutely take that and run with it because it is probably the most glowing of feedback you are ever going to get from an event like that. And it's great, you know? So I'm looking at this and, and thinking, this is all good. There was one comment that I saw in the chat through the whole of the final, I wish the casters were more insightful. One comment. And that is what stuck with me. And it's funny how that happens because we are our own biggest critics uh, more often than not. And stuff that happens in the chat, you kind of have to water off a duck's back, let it go. You know, Twitch chat is just toxic as um, more often than not. And you have to uh, go along with this and, you know, accept that's the case. And again, don't let it get to you. Accept that this is what you're going to get. Don't take it too personally. Just look through and find if there is anything constructive in there that you can use. That's always a bonus, and you can get some good stuff from that, much like I did um, it, out of that particular comment. And the reason that it stuck with me is because I thought, you know what, they're right. They were absolutely right. I hadn't played a competitive game of Counter-Strike for 18 months. And while I watched a fair amount with a headset on, commentating on it, I wasn't playing it myself. I wasn't getting that feeling of being in those situations. And while I do have that experience in playing the game across the various versions since 05, that doesn't necessarily mean that it applies or that it's fresh in the memory. And that tidbit of information may not come to me in the moment when I need it. And that set me off on a journey of uh, about 18 months after that, playing three, four times a week, playing in a team, playing league matches, not to any kind of decent standard. I will uh, throw that in the mix right away. Um, and all that sort of culminated in passing a trial um, for a community team I was part of to join their LAN team. And it was uh, four players that had level 10 face-its and were uh, very, very strong individual players that had been playing together for a while. Unfortunately, their fifth um, couldn't make it and flying to the UK for the event. So I got drafted in out of the uh, community. And that was kind of my culmination, thinking, right, I spent 18 months at this. I've been going for it. I'm not being full-time because I'm working full-time and I've been casting in between as well. But I've been playing four times a week for a year and a half. I'm feeling extra crispy as far as my Counter-Strike goes. I'm ready to pop heads. Bottom fragged every game bar one. Yeah, that's life. And that shows just how far away... I am from any kind of decent standard, despite putting that kind of legwork in. Just didn't have the uh, natural ability to go with, wasn't putting the time in because of my four hours. I stacked loads of people putting in eight. And for those weekends that I took off where I'm seeing my other half, these people were putting in eight. And yeah, it, it just really started to show. Uh, but uh, hey, it was uh, an experience nonetheless. And I had stacked loads of time under my belt playing competitively in a team format, playing as main orper in the team I was in, actually. And that was a, an interesting experience. Uh, nonetheless, the orper is such an influential weapon uh, in uh, contests. 
and it's something that you want to be able to relate some personal experience to. And, you know, I, I had the same. I had situations where, you know, I was on a tear. I'd drop a first half 20 bomb and would completely change the face of a game. Um, there would be other games when I would be lucky to hit double figures across the whole match, couldn't get anything going, couldn't make it work, couldn't get myself in a position where I could be effective and uh, the problems that uh, cropped up with that. All valuable experience that I can throw into the mix when I'm talking about a game. Now, I was brought up in a time of solo casting as being a major thing. Um, I was brought up in a time when the colour and the play-by-play uh, -play divide when there was dual comms was very, very separate. And then the big thing that I had going for me at the time, um, round about, this is going to be years ago, of course, but round about the time when I was in the picture as one of the uh, top commentators in the UK, possibly in Europe even, uh, for Counter-Strike. Now, I was stepping in between. I could do colour, I could do play-by-play, -play, I could mix in between, um, and that was how I, I set myself up and you know put myself in a position to have a great cast with whoever you put me with. I'd just play to their strengths and fill in around them, and you know we got a, a great result out of it. So you could maybe argue that if you are doing play-by-play, -play, do you necessarily need that same in-game experience? Surely your colour guy is the one that has the uh, experience and would give you that from a first-person perspective. And I kind of get that, but I also feel that the route that I took and continue to take of making sure you can do a bit of both and solo cast on the regular is um, something that is super useful uh, to have in your uh, arsenal. And uh, is it relevant? Well, yeah, it, it kind of is relevant because the way that you think the game works from a play-by-play -play, uh, setup, depending on what it is, of course, you know, and Counter-Strike is a really good example because there are money and you have to choose which guns you buy and the meta or basically the way that the game is played um, changes. So what might have been, oh, let's not buy in this situation, then becomes, uh, let's buy a few things. And that can change over the course of a game. And the way maps play um, can change over the course of a game. I think it's the same with uh, anything, though. Changes happen. Patches happen. New maps come in. New characters come in. And the way that certain abilities work in a game will get changed. The way certain items scale in a game can get changed. And it's constantly moving. It's the kind of thing where you can read it in patch notes. Like, you can read everything that comes out and every news article about how this works and how this plays and how this does this and that. And you can understand it in theory. And you could probably understand it in practice as well, as long as you know that's the case. But nothing feels the same as getting hands-on with it and using it in a real-life player situation. And uh, I think it's important that whatever role you find yourself in, you keep your hand in. In, in some way or another, even if you have two hours a couple of times a week at the weekend or whatever, if that's all you can fit in or you haven't got any cars and we just jump on and play a game or two. It doesn't have to be ranked, doesn't have to be anything super serious. Just go and play and get in the mix. The more you can do, is, of course, that's going to help you at no end, but I feel like that's something that uh, is useful. Solo casting as well. Now, this is something that uh, I highly, highly, highly recommend. If you end up in a casting partnership or you know, you've got regular gigs where you're going to be commentating on a league or whatever or, or some kind of setup like that, but you know that you don't necessarily know who your partner's going to be, but you know there is going to be a partner in there at some point, you tend to fall into this rhythm, especially if you are a set color guy or you're a set play-by-play -play guy. You know that you're going to be doing play-by-play -play with some color guy, whoever that happens to be. And you end up pigeonholing yourself into, this is my thing, this is what I'm good at, this is what I need to get better at, and all that good stuff. Fine. Nice setup to be in. You know, Comfortable, regular work, having someone to bounce off every time. You, know, you can always usually find a way to make that work but solo casting I mean solo casting is what was a thing <laughs> that we did just in general you know um, back in the day 
I mean, you could sometimes get away with it, but uh, it was uh, tough to get a stream going and then two people in a, a voice chat like a team speaker or a ventrilo or whatever without a super big delay and to make that happen and to make it work it was um, really difficult and you know the way that casting used to be at times when the UK didn't have any real bandwidth to do any streaming is uh, we would jump on the go it was um, HL TV at the time no um, Source TV it was Counter Strike Source. So back in Source, we would all jump on Source TV, us casters, and uh, all the viewers would jump in Source TV, and we would all sit in uh, TeamSpeak or uh, something like that, and then we would commentate to the TeamSpeak to the people listening on the delay of um, what was going on on, on the server. Um, so when you're trying to get that kind of setup coordinated, making sure your team speaks got enough slots to cover all the viewers that want to come in and sit and listen to it, you know, that was tough. Um, so, and the other setup as well is that you would stream to a, a shoutcast server, which is why we're called uh, shoutcasters. And then, you know, people could watch on the TV, but then they'd have to pause it and stop and start the stream of the audio to make that sync up with the go tv and you'd have to tell people around you in and, and whatever so it was an absolute nightmare to try and get it done the way to simplify that as much as possible is to solo cast so solo casting is what i did all the time and when you're solo casting you need to give a bit of color you need to give a bit of play by play you need to tie it all together you need to produce the banter but Rather than have it between two people, you have to then sort of get that going yourself and just make the whole thing flow, paint a picture, um, give some insight, and try and make that all work as a, a one thing. Now, if you have spent your whole time just doing one or the other, that becomes quite difficult to then try and throw in the analysis when you just call what happens and call the kill feed and where people are on the map and that sort of thing. Um, if you are very good and have your knowledge of the game, trying to relay that in the context of what's happening in the action right in front of you and pace that and not talk over, you know, finishing off your point while the main frags are happening and the main entries are happening. Um, you know, again, that's difficult and that's a tough thing to um, try and, and get a handle on. And this is the sort of thing that happens naturally when you've got two people that are comfortable in these roles and you think well, you've got two people doing two different things trying to get it to sync up. Surely that would be the problem. But actually, <laughs> you tend to find that the most uh, when you are, um, yeah, when you're uh, doing it on your own, which is interesting. And I think it's a, a good thing uh, to keep an eye out for. Uh, evening to Lukey D TV. We've had uh, a fellow caster join uh, for this, which is um, always cool. I'm not sure how long you've been watching, Luke, but just going over a, a few things um, about uh, you know, how to get out of a funk if you're in one, how to handle a bad game. Um, I, I had a bit of a bad game last night, so uh, it was fresh in the mind. Um, but yeah, I think if you don't solo cast at the moment, then solo casting is the best way that you can uh, start to uh, improve yourself. You don't have to show anyone, to be honest. You can just record it and, and keep it for yourself and watch your back yourself and, and write some notes on it. But getting out of your comfort zone is the best way um, to do that and to have to bring out um, your action uh, or bring out the action from both sides all at once. That can be uh, a big thing. And if you've got that, you can show it to someone else and get them to give you some constructive feedback on top of it as well. And if they can see you solo casting and, and bringing the whole thing, then they can give you pointers across both aspects. Plus, it gives you more opportunities as well. You know, for me, if someone says, can you do color? Yeah, fine. Can you do play by play? Yeah, fine. Uh, the other guy dropped out. Can you just solo cast this quick? Is that right? Like, yeah, fine. No worries. Absolutely fine. Not a problem. And it's nice to be in that um, sort of situation. Um, I think that is the same in a lot of industries as well, actually. In the music industry, for example, you know, if you're looking to try and get a, uh, a gig somewhere, um, if you can also sing backing vocals, that probably gives you a slight edge over uh, someone else that may be better on that instrument. It just is another feather in your bow. 
and uh, a few of the podcasts and whatever that I've listened to, the uh, musicians say that they, whether they are great at it or not, they say that they can sing backing vocals just because it's another thing, another feather in their cap and that sort of thing. And, and you can do that with your casting as well. If you can bring in other games or you can fill both roles or you could observe. Um, you know, observing is an, another way that you can get a foot in the door um, as a starting point. And, you know, that's that's another thing. We're getting off topic. We are straight away getting off topic here. Um, well, I say straight away, we're half an hour into it. But uh, we are uh, definitely getting off topic a bit with this one. Um, if you are uh, able to get your foot in the door somewhere doing something, even if it's not behind the mic right, right away, then it gets you into the minds of the people that are going to be making that decision. And if you are um, doing well, you do a good job in whatever that happens to be, you show yourself to be professional, then you may well end up being one of the first names on the list to be considered uh, going forward. Unless the other guys that were behind the mic did a great job of it. But hey, you know, at least you're in there, you're in the mix, uh, you're getting some work, you're getting some things that you can put on your CV, and hopefully you're getting a little bit of cash out of that as well, depending on on what kind of level that uh, you're at and your experience and, and the like. But uh, that's a good thing. And by taking on these other roles, even if it's observing and it is completely away from the behind the mic stuff, you know, that is getting you on the track to seeing the game from a different perspective. You don't need to talk about it, but you need to preempt and see the action happening before it happens so that you can get yourself into uh, that position uh, to show that to the viewers and you know, all these things added together allows you to get a uh, better understanding of uh, how the game works and how you can bring that across to your audience. Um, another thing that you could do if you're feeling uh, a little stuck in your routine is change something up as far as your partnerships go. Now this is uh, the same uh, kind of thing as uh, the solo cast, maybe from the different angle. Maybe if you solo cast a lot and you've been putting your time into that and you feel like you're running out of things to say, well, then maybe this is the time to start jumping into some uh, casting with someone else. Work with a partner, work with different partners. Um, if you're comfortable and you have been solo casting and you've been working on both your roles, swap. You, know, you might find someone in the same position one time you could do color, the next map you could do play by play, you could switch it up that way, that kind of thing. Or you might just wing it. You know, you might not assign a role and you might just jump in and have a chat and see who slots into what and make it work that way. And that is probably some of my... <sighs> okay, this is, um, this is tough. Uh, it's probably some of my favorite to commentate has come out of that situation where you do just wing it and get into it and see where you go. It's a lot of fun to work that way and uh, it's and it's very unpredictable, usually in a good way because you're both comfortable there. You can slot in wherever it, the uh, wind takes you and just make it work to put a great cast out. But I think some of the best actual work that I've have put out has been when there has been those assigned roles. Um, I've got someone who is going to be comfortable in a particular role, usually in this situation, which is why they're sticking to that. And then my role, my my sort of goal then is to make sure that they sound the absolute best that they can be. They're playing to their strengths. Any of the weaknesses that they have in their approach, I'm picking those up. I'm filling those gaps. I'm making it work. And uh, in, in that environment, everyone kind of flourishes. And I think that's where some of the best stuff um, then comes from. But, you know, a partnership that has good chemistry and can just bounce off each other like nothing ever happened, um, you know, that is also a great thing. And you see that a lot on um, stages and at the uh, very highest level. The problem with that is that is not how it is on a regular basis. Sometimes you find that one guy and you click with that one guy and it's perfect and you know it just works. Um, you know sometimes that doesn't happen right away and you have to work together for an extended period a year 18 months before you know you really do get that um, 
sort of telepathic relationship with them. And it does build, and it builds quicker than you think it would. Um, but you, know, you do have to spend the time to develop that. And uh, you know, it, it's useful. If you're not used to working with partners at all, or you are used to working with a partner or a couple of partners that work in a certain way, it's good to freshen it up and work with someone else because they will throw things at you that you're not expecting. You're not going through your same routines. Um, you're not going through the same questions, but in different ways. Uh, you know, they will throw things at you that will challenge you and may slip you up once in a while. But again, we go back to that thing we said right at the start. These things happen, mistakes happen. You know, sometimes you don't deal with things as well as you would like them to, and you'd like that moment back so you could answer the question in the right way. But it happens. Sometimes they will throw something at you that you don't expect. You can learn. You can develop a better answer next time that comes around, and you will know how to handle that particular situation. Um, what else do I want to mention on this front? Because I'll probably save this one as a uh, highlight on the channel, so it's not going to disappear and, and people can go back to it and uh, listen to it. So we've touched on the if you have a bad game. We've touched on the how to mix it up if you uh, get in a funk. And what else? Probably want to loop back around to if you have a, a bad game. Uh, to a point and, and how to deal with that and how to deal with the feedback. Now, I, partly out of my own, it's not out of cheapness. It is buying a second monitor. Yeah, okay, that's more like an investment in my casting thing, but then I've got this guitar over here that looks really cool or I've got this watch over here that I'm thinking about saving for. And Oh, I've not been to Florida in a while. Let's get a holiday booked. Um, <laughs> these are all the things that come into... Uh, that factor into my decision making as far as money goes and then investing in a second monitor to allow me to run better streams. I mean, that would be a great idea. That would make sense. But I tend not to make that choice and, and put that money elsewhere. Uh, but because I've got the single monitor, I don't really look at chat all that much or interact with chat all that much. And, you know, we didn't have a chat <laughs> a lot of the time. Um, other than you might get a Steam message if you get to turn off your uh, friends uh, list. Um, but yeah, that wasn't really a thing coming up. And I tend to follow that style more than anything else rather than you know, get looped into a chat and distracted that way and and spend uh, any time interacting and, and missing some of the action that's uh, happening on the screen. But I know that a lot of guys will actively uh, get involved in the chat and I think the problem with that is you know, it's it's probably not good for your self-esteem to do that. Uh, it's probably, I mean, it depends. You know, interacting with a chat can elevate and lift and make everyone feel like they're involved in the uh, stream and what's happening. But generally, uh, it, it's tough. I don't think it adds a huge amount to a game. A competitive game where people have come to watch the game, unless it's a community event, of course, that's a different story. But if you're talking about a competitive league or a competitive competition and everyone came to play and the people that have uh, tuned in, some of them are just coming on to rail the casters and rail the players and just get into uh, whatever kind of keyboard warrior kind of battles that they can until they get uh, timed out of the chat. Uh, but Generally, people are there to watch that game, that team, that organization, and that caster, probably. And I think uh, I've had some that have watched a game with two teams that they don't care about because it's me casting the game, uh, which is always awesome um, to have that, actually. And I, I really appreciate that level of support. But I'm sure um, the casters that do this on a full-time basis will have that to a, a larger scale. Uh, where they have a fan base that follows them around on the regular. And they would uh, be here to hear that caster do what they do um, to the uh, very best of their ability. And, you know, sometimes that gets lost a little bit in, in chat, but I'm wandering off again on a, a rant about chat. Um, more to the point of don't let that get to you too much. We all know what it is. <laughs> We all know that it's going to be a wading pool of toxicity. And uh, like I said at the start, if there's constructive criticism in there, look at it, think about it, take it on board if it's relevant, 
Um, if it's not, then let it go. If it's if it's kind of relevant but not, again, you know, take it on board, but don't dwell on it too much because sometimes you know you have your style, and while changing something about that style may make you a little more mainstream as such. You don't want to be a cookie cutter copy of uh, your favourite caster or the caster that is the man of the hour. And uh, I've had a few people, <laughs> for example, in the UK that have said that they watch some of my old casts uh, to give them, you know, to learn how to do it more than anything else, which is uh, a, a really um, great thing and a, a humbling thing to hear. But, you know, those guys have gone on and they've developed their own style off of the back of that. You know, it's not a, a bunch of mini crosses running around at, at uh, LAN events. And, you know, that's something that you need to uh, avoid as well. Don't... Uh, yeah, don't go and change your approach too much to try and sound like someone else or, or sound like whoever else is um, out there. And I guess this is another thing that fits into both um, in terms of how you have a bad game or if you're just feeling a little uh, stale in what you're trying to do is make sure you have your own voice. You know? Don't try and be anywhere at anyone else or... Or um, the like, make sure that your personality comes across. And by all means, watch some of your favourite play-by-play commentators or colour commentators in the game and you know look at how they approach things. But take it in terms of a look at what their approach is rather than look at how... Well, look at how they deliver, but don't look at what they deliver. You know, don't steal their catchphrases or look at the way that they transition from one thing into another and then do it in exactly the same way just with um, different words you know you can change up the pace of things a little bit just make sure really that when the main action is happening that is your focus and when you're in the lulls either in between rounds or while things are setting up or the like that's when wisdom and experience and analysis happens um, for the most part. So if you're talking about play by play, okay, so they are standing around spawn and we are waiting for the 10 seconds to tick away until people can move and they're buying things. That is, that yeah, that's very, very base level and no one wants to hear about that, but that's a great opportunity where you can talk about how the economy of the game works, how this team it's their last full spend before they've got nothing left in the account and would have to go for a save next time out. Or this is where they're changing up their abilities and uh, how they're setting up. Maybe they're looking for a uh, invade opportunity or a gank opportunity early on within the first couple of minutes of the game, if we're talking like a League of Legends or a Dota. That's about the extent of my knowledge <laughs> of those games in, in trying to commentate them. But, um, hey, there you go. That's another thing to throw in the mix as well. And I say this one loosely um, and make sure that it's not, um, I'm not guiding you down the wrong path here, but look at other games. Now, there is some danger to this. And I see some people that will cast League of Legends and they'll cast Counter-Strike and they'll cast Overwatch and they'll cast Valorant and they'll cast PUBG and they will take on about 27 different games. And if they're full time, you know, maybe they can get enough playtime in on the competitive front and be able to research enough and watch enough and whatever and be able to carry themselves in multiple games, multiple titles. Um, from my point of view, I think that's a, a bit of a struggle for me. Uh, I could probably get away with something like FIFA, and I've done FIFA before and, and commentated FIFA, and um, I have covered other games for example um, round about the time of Source um, I was also playing competitively in uh, COD 4 uh, I was probably better at COD 4 than I was at Counter Strike um, so I felt fairly comfortable there and Quake was another one that I did but I was playing all of those games to enough of an extent that I knew them from a competitive standpoint to be able to carry those um, but my main focus of course was uh, in Counter Strike now 
bit of a struggle. I know bits about Valorant. I know bits about Apex Legends. Um, I know bits about League of Legends. I, I play them all and I jump on and, and have a bit of fun with them. But that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to want to jump in and uh, commentate them at any kind of um, competitive or, or good level. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't. Doesn't mean you shouldn't look at some of these other games and how they work and how they operate and play them and then commentate them a little bit as well. Even if it's just recording and doing it for a bit of fun for your own uh, enjoyment and see how you adapt to it. And you can, yeah, it, it gives you something fresh to think about. It takes you out the space of this main game that uh, you're looking at the whole time. And uh, you know you have to then look for, for new ways to explain things. You have to look at what's going on. You have to analyze this new game. And um, yeah, I think that's quite um, an interesting thing to be able to do once in a while. It just gives you that break. It gives you that break to step away from this game that you um, spend a lot of time watching, playing, talking about, have done for a while. You know, it's uh, your income, possibly, if you're doing this as a um, either a part-time thing like me or it's your full-time thing. It could be what you need to pay the bills. And when you're in that position, these things stop getting fun real quick, you know? And uh, especially when you spend that much time on it, it can start to feel like a chore to fire up that game. Fire up another game. But look at it from the perspective of being a caster or if you're being a player and you're doing this from the player standpoint, fire up a different game and look at it from the player standpoint. You, know? you don't want to spend so long on it that you forget how to do the other thing, but just seeing it from a different perspective and, you know, I think if you try and limp through a cast of a game that you have played a few competitive uh, matches on, maybe done your placement matches and that's about it, and you try and limp through and perform that to the same level as your main game, you may start to feel a heck of a lot better about that bad cast on your main game and, and realize that it was uh, nowhere near as bad as you thought it was and you can pick yourself up and you can smash it out of the park next time and you don't want to have to go and learn a new game again you know enough about this one game to be able to carry on and cast well and do a job with it and that's got to be your plan and uh, it will all be fine you know sometimes you need to uh, put that in context and while it sounds a little bit like kicking a man while he's down well yeah it, it is but um and another example uh, for me, I played football twice a week before COVID happened. I played tennis to county level before COVID happened. And uh, those things were off the table for a long, long time. The first sport that I could really play was golf. <laughs> and golf is something that I was decent at when I was um, sort of 11, 12 years old or something. Didn't really play that much beyond that because tennis became a thing. Um, then I played golf maybe once or twice a year when one of my friends talked me into it and was terrible. But because it was the only sport that I could play, I decided I was going to take it semi-seriously. And golf used to be a sport that drove me absolutely mental because I'd play it once a year and I wouldn't be able to do anything particularly useful with it, as you would expect. Like, that's the standard. Uh, but it frustrated the heck out of me. This year when I said, right, okay, I'm going to start taking this semi-seriously and play a lot more and whatever, and I end up being completely calm about it because I'm thinking, this isn't football, this isn't tennis, this isn't Counter-Strike, this isn't commentating, this isn't something that I am expecting or expected to be any good at. And it turns out I've gone in and I'm okay. You know, I can get around, I can play around a golf, I can do okay, I can only lose four or five balls. I'm not smashing through all the 12 that I took out with me. And that's me kicking the webcam. Nice one. Um, yeah. And I can get around and I can enjoy it, even though it doesn't go particularly well. And it's okay. And that would be the same as if you tried to cast another game that you are far less familiar with. It's going to be okay. You're going to be able to make it work to a point. <laughs> you know, you can use your play-by-play -play skills. It's not going to be brilliant. It doesn't have to be brilliant. It's okay. And it will show you and it will make you appreciate the things that you are good at and how comfortable that is and how easy that is. And you feel then so much more positive about it, but also so much more relaxed about it. It's like, okay, I had a rough one. Just going to brush that off. No problem. I can do this and deliver once again. 
I think that's all I've got for now. And as we weren't running a QA and a session, I didn't properly announce this or whatever. I'm going to uh, just call it here and uh, drop off, I think. Um, closing statements. And uh, just to summarize it all in one, if you have one bad game, it's not a problem. Think about the positives. Um, learn from the mistakes, but learn from them in a constructive manner uh, so that you can improve from them and don't let them get you down. Uh, take Twitch chat with a pinch of salt because that can really suck any kind of self-belief that you have out of you. It's a toxic environment generally. That is uh, one of those things. Uh, if you are feeling like you are um, yeah, a little stuck in your uh, current routine, change it up. If you're a play-by-play -play guy, try and do some color work, vice versa. If you're always in a partnership with someone, try a different partner once in a while. It's not like cheating on your wife. You can cast with other people. And the things that you learn from doing that, when you bring that back to your existing partnership, that is going to help you no end. Solo cast as well. Even if you don't put it out there anywhere or stream it, record solo cast. That is the biggest way where you can learn some new skills that you might not necessarily have to use in a duo cast. And it will expose plenty of areas that you can work on much better than you can looking where you're sharing half of the airtime uh, with someone else. Um, make sure that you're playing competitively. Play competitively in the games that you're talking about, even if it's not to any kind of level and you only play a couple of games a week. Keep your hand in and um, make sure that the experiences that you are relating are still applicable to the way that the game plays in current day because these things change by patches and updates and nerfs and the usual. And you might sound a little out of date when you're uh, dealing with viewers that are playing competitively on a regular basis. And use this sparingly, but play another game or some other games once in a while and maybe have a little stab at commentating those and see how different and how much of a struggle that is compared to what you do in your most familiar game or familiar games. And you know, be proud of that. Be proud of what you can do. Be proud of your abilities. Understand that you have room to grow. Even the best have room to grow. No one's perfect. And um, even those guys that are working at the top level to um, a couple of hundred thousand or plus viewers at times at major events, you know, they have had rough casts in the past. They will have rough casts in the future. And they may have those rough casts on the biggest of big stages. It happens to the best of us, and it happens way more than you think it would. Whether you've done one game or you've done a 1,000 games, it can happen, and it's fine. Thank you very much for watching, guys. Uh, it was a little uh, off the cuff. Uh, that tends to be a thing, so I'm, I'm sure that uh, unless someone happened to be scrolling through Twitter around about 7 o'clock on a uh, Saturday night and didn't have anything better to do, which is... Uh, nigh on impossible. Um, I doubt this will have been seen live. But any questions that you have, uh, any comments, that sort of thing, then my Twitter is, am I going to point the right way? Got it right first time. There we go. So my Twitter's over there. You could drop me a message on Twitch as well. Um, but yeah, please get in touch if you have any questions, thoughts, comments. Uh, if you want to um, you know, jump on and talk through a few of your own experiences and your own problems with me, um, then I am more than happy to uh, do that for you. And if I happen to get inundated with questions, we might do like a QA and a answering session at, at some point that will be planned better and uh, be there in the future. Um, I'm also trying to uh, lock down a more regular streaming schedule so I can do a couple of things a week uh, guaranteed. That's still a work in progress. And to tie me down to any kind of regular schedule has always been tough. But we are uh, working on it, and uh, we move to try and get that done. Uh, thank you very much. This has been Crossy for Eclipse Gaming TV, and I will catch you uh, very soon.